Madhav Dhar is joining us uh, from Delhi right now. Madhav is a veteran in the market and uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here, Madhav, on the show. Thanks very much. We last spoke on the 29th of December. Morning. Uh, the Nifty has uh, lost a thousand points from that level. Madhav, way from here. <laughs> Well, that's the trillion dollar question. Uh, you know, Nifty and equity markets are growth assets and the world is going through a growth shock and trying to calibrate and reprice the growth shock. And it's sort of started in China uh, and reverberating through the world, probably best exemplified by the price of oil. So I think it's an interesting dynamic that growth expectations have to come down. I think they've, they've, they've been too high, they're still too high, but markets are starting to price it in finally, quickly and violently. I think it took some time, but I think where we are now, I think we're in the process of probably trying to uh, create a complex bottom of this big cycle. And I guess what I wrestle with, what why my dilemma is, that there's no question in my mind that you're going to have a hard landing in China. It's already underway. Commodities are already telling you that. You know, Brazilian assets down 80% in U.S. dollars over the last four years are already telling you that and pricing that. The What's happening to, to uh, world banking and financial stocks are telling you that not only are things bad, we may be in for a big-time crisis. So for a value contrarian sort of person like me, I'm finally starting to get encouraged that things are being recognized and priced in. And the other great line is that, you know, markets stop panicking when central banks start panicking. And this, you know, uh, uh, final move to decisively negative rates, starting with the Bank of Japan and in Sweden and so on, is, pro I think, the final stage of a full-blown monetary policy panic, which may put a floor into risk assets, it may not. But I think we're in a complex bottoming out process. And I mean, your question was specific to the Nifty. I think Nifty is a little healthier, frankly. I mean, I think it's in the emerging markets bucket. It's going to get hit uh, along with everything else. It has been hit less hard uh, compared to other emerging markets for obvious reasons. I think it's in a healthier position and it is a beneficiary of uh, commodities. But still, it's a risk asset, it's a growth asset, it's an emerging market asset, and uh, it has gotten hit. And separately, we haven't done some of the things we could do uh, locally to get our growth engines revving. I, for one, I'm starting to get uh, bullish, much more excited, as you and I have talked. I mean, I was very disappointed in last year's budget, and I thought that was a time to get out. Expectations were very high, and the unfolding reality didn't look as good. I think a little bit, I, I feel sort of the opposite coming into the, the you know, budget uh, time, just that I think expectations are low. There is tremendous fear in the markets worldwide, and uh, asset prices have certainly discounted a lot. So I'm feeling encouraged, and you know, based on nothing, I think the odds are that the budget probably will be a positive surprise. So world growth starts bottoming somewhere here. We do a little bit in our domestic engines, and I, I, I think the, you know, in, India should be okay. I mean, that, that, that's my uh, sort of the broad brush, how I see India and the world around it. You know, Mother, people have gone from uh, saying that hate the market but love my stocks to hating the market and having no conviction in my stocks. Uh, but this entire thing of market pricing in this growth shock, what is a good framework to understand? Is it priced in? Is it just the beginning? Uh, because as we've spoken so many times over the last few years, this, I mean, this entire QE business has really be distorted things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, I, I think that's an art more than a science. I think you feel this, feel it rather than uh, actively measure it. But I think what is encouraging me, I mean, you could have made the same statement a year ago or two years ago. What's encouraging me in the last six months is the violence of the move down. And I think about a year ago, we were saying, yes, China is slowing, but they'll be able to manage it, which I certainly very skeptical about. I don't think you can manage, you know, a $10 trillion economy uh, of, that, of that size and complexity. 
now there is a full-blown understanding that China is in deep trouble, deep trouble. Its banks are in trouble. The, the, the Shanghai stock market's down 60%, and that's telling you something. And if that weren't enough, oil has gone from $140 a barrel to 28 So that's pricing in something. So what's encouraging me that the, the risk assets have been drifting down, but the complete collapse, and I think you don't see it in the S&P and you don't see it in India. I mean, we're talking about uh, Nifty losing 1,000 points. I mean, that's 13%. Uh, Brazil is down 80 in U.S. dollars, H zero. So that's starting to price in something. And as usually happens near bottoms, is there's always a reason why it can go lower. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is the absolute low, but I, there's no question in my mind we're getting close to it, that everybody wants to buy, you know, State Bank of India, for example, four years ago because of financial inclusion, you know, uh, distribution, blah, 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 two and a half times book. Nobody wants to buy it at 80% of book value now because we all know the book, book value is useless. And that's not the way to look at it. You don't understand. The write-offs are coming. That's what creates bottoms when everybody absolutely understands why there's a problem. Brazil down 80%. Everybody gets it. They're corrupt. You know, Petrobras had a corruption scandal. Commodity prices are going to zero and staying there forever. And you have leftist politics in Brazil. I get it. That's why it's down 80%. So I think you're getting to a point back to uh, pricing, getting rational, perhaps overshooting its equilibrium. And that, as I said, is an art rather than a science. I tend to be early on things. And so I think we are getting there. So uh, I'm, I mean, if I had a portfolio, I'd be at least half in or a third in and see how this violent bottoming out process goes. And uh, especially in India, I would say at the margin, I'm a little more encouraged. And there is a lot more talk, coordination between finance ministry and RBI on the banking system. It's not exactly what you want to hear as a purist, but the talk and the actions are entirely different than what we've had in the past. I think Bank of Baroda's actions a few days ago were, uh, frankly, in the Indian context, remarkable. And the stock popped and so on. So I think... At least, if we're not solving everything perfectly, we're actually addressing things, and they're out in the open. And, and recognition of the problem and addressing is, 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 is the first part of the bottoming out process. So the recognition that uh, uh, you know, commodities are bust is apparent. The recognition that China has a hard landing is apparent. The recognition that global monetary policy has run its course is recognition. The fact that Indian banking system has to be fixed before anything can happen is recognized. So that is a, is, is a, is a brew of, uh, for me, as a contrarian, I, I like that. I, I think prices are low, fear is high, and you can see some marginal recognition of the problem. And that usually is a sign of, uh, uh, I mean, if not the bottom, I mean, just the sign of a bottoming out process. So I think okay, that, if you bought something now, Nifty at 7,000, I think two years from now you'll probably be happy. Okay, okay, okay. So that's a, a clear thing. And I think it's, it's interesting as well. Uh, what you're saying is when everyone recognizes the problem, I mean, the dirt is out in the open, uh, and people do get the reason why stocks are where they are and why they've fallen so much. Uh, that's that's the that's the start of making a making a some sort of a bottom, right? That's that's the point. Not the uh, not uh, addressing the problem, yes. solving yeah, the problem, exactly. but just the recognition. Exactly. exactly. So, and the point is that good things don't make you money. Improving things make you money. So, I'm just saying that from 28, I think the price of oil will probably improve. You know, from where we are on bank stock pricing. I think recognition and solutions will probably improve. I mean, I don't say it with very high conviction. If I could prove it to you, stocks would already be up. So by definition, the point, if we are somewhere, the point of maximum uncertainty tends to be a low. So I'm not sh sure whether right now, as you and I speak, this is the point of maximum uncertainty, but it's pretty uncertain. If it's pretty uncertain and relatively cheap and people are relatively scared, you must have a position in it if you're a medium, longer-term player. It's simpler. To me, it's as simple as that. 
it's not easy it's 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 difficult and and uh, and it's scary but uh, it's not complex and, and i guess my point is i mean you will see i mean we uh, and we talked about it uh, i don't know if it was two months ago or six months ago that that there was a bubble in tech uh, and especially this internet stuff and i i i'm willing to bet and i told you then i'll tell you that again i i think you will have new rounds of financing down 50% down 70% in many of these stocks and and so as i said these things are not always measured you can sense them i mean the psychological madness that that everything uh, mobile related is going to go to the moon was a sign of a top uh, of some kind not that these businesses won't exist and they won't do well they will but the pricing will change and similarly i mean state bank of india will exist you know uh, Brazilian iron ore companies will exist. Don't question my mind, even though they're being priced for nothing. So, you know the old Warren Buffett line that in the short term the market's a voting machine, which is what you're seeing, and in the long term it's a weighing machine. So, and and by that it means weighing machine means entry point of valuations and what happens to earnings. So I think the entry point of valuations is getting quite attractive. I mean broadly for emerging markets, you're at. Uh, you know eight or nine times earnings i mean you, you may quibble with the earnings you may say it's ev ebitda whatever the heck it is and you may say that the banking stock price to book means nothing deutsche bank is selling at 0.3 times book who cares book value will be wiped out yeah, but it's telling you something you know something that oversold is telling you something dlf stock down 95% is telling you that something is getting priced in and then you have to have some conviction on the other hand that uh margins are at all 20 year lows either you have to say they will stay there and therefore stocks won't do well or you will say these are structurally cyclically depressed and will probably rise a little bit growth will probably start picking up from these these very very depressed levels and if that happens i mean you you have a picture of what earnings will be will be and i mean you forced me to make a bet and i said you know i think the market will be up 30% over 2 years i mean yeah we are down 7 8% from there but i still feel that i still feel that by the by the end of next year we would have been up about 25 or 30% so i think we're on track of that the the path to that is violent given the global backdrop and again i mean for your viewers it's been very very complex uh, this whole cycle starting from 2008 that instead of solving the problem we papered it over with liquidity and we we reamped the cycle from 2009 to recently and the tide is now going out and you're going to see who's swimming naked as they say and as the tide goes out the weakest get exposed the first whether it's oversupply in china whether it's commodity whether it's they're exposed the most the strongest and the, and the and the the economies that have made the greatest strides like the united states in sort of solving its banking problem having different modes of growth are are standing relatively firm and i would throw india in the same category within emerging markets i mean yeah i mean i'm frustrated we haven't done a bunch of things we could have done with the mandate we had over the last 12 18 months but it's relatively strong i mean the rupee has appreciated 12% on a trade weighted basis in the middle of what is a growth crisis so it's telling you something <clears throat> okay fair enough what will you know there are so many of these big global debates and it's kind of hard to pinpoint which one is driving price action uh, you know on any given day or any given week uh, but what will cause prices to settle a lot higher mother i mean you you said it's a, a lot of it is just the feel right and so my question to you is something's got to change right at, at the incremental at the margin something's got to change uh, or as i asked you in the value investing show that we did and i asked you well uh, you know markets don't come to an end right i mean uh, markets go on you gave me multiple examples uh, going back 100 year, years in history uh, as to how life for example german stocks came to an end and i don't remember the dates etc but you remember our conversation uh, what is uh, why yes, are do. you so yeah. sure well this is this isn't one of that one of that one of those actually yeah no and i i mean if i recall that uh, conversation we had i also said that i'm never sure of anything i have different degrees of conviction about different things but as a scientist i have to tell you i'm never 100% sure of anything 
It's just that when you see an 80% bet, you want to take it. So I'm 80% sure the state bank is not going bankrupt. I'm 80% sure that somewhere here, buying a underperforming, massive financial distribution company, which is going to get better and better governance in the fastest growing growth economy in the world, is going to look a lot better three years from now, especially if I get in at 80% of book. If they write off half the book, it's one and a half times book. So what? Am I 100% am I convinced? No. Am I 50-50? No, I'm 80% convinced. So is, is there a chance? I mean, Lehman Brothers ended history, right? Japan uh, in 1940s, if you invest in the stock market, it went close to zero, practically zero. A bunch of things got wiped out. Second World War, German stuff. But in general, Argentina has gone to zero. You know, uh, Venezuela is about to go to zero, more than likely. Zimbabwe has gone to zero. So, yes, there are examples in history where th history ends. But by and large, it doesn't. By and large, in modern economies, it doesn't. Banks can, by the way. Banks are leveraged assets, and they can go to zero. But at the same time, there's a predisposition by governments to not to let them go to zero. So anyway, the simple point I'm making is that in the end, you're not. what happens in these global debates, as you're saying, people get wrapped up in their theory of how the world works and in their egos. They want to tell you a pinpoint forecast with 100% certainty. The way I operate is exactly the opposite. I want to be vaguely right about something than precisely wrong. And I'm willing to act with 100% conviction with 80% feeling, which is a hard thing to do sometimes. You have to train yourself to do that. So you may sound more assertive. You may, because in the end, talking and investing are different things. So if you're a think tank, you're a, you're a talking head, you can talk all you want. But in the end, the trade is digital. Did you buy it or, you, or did you not? Did you buy it in size or did you not? So you have to act with 100% decisiveness, but you may have only 70% conviction. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And to me, this is one of those times. I mean, I'm ready to act decisively, and I, I'm not 100% convinced. Usually when I'm 100% convinced, I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, I think... Uh, that that quote be I'm, I'm I want to be vaguely right rather than being precisely wrong. I think one of the great lines. Uh, so you're saying uh, so what should one do? Start for Indian investors who can buy Indian stocks and uh, what should one do? Start buying Nifty ETF or I, I think we should buy more Indian in? stocks. Yeah, I mean you've asked me this. Yeah, yeah you've asked me this. You've asked me this uh, over the last year, and I've been sort of dithering because I felt like dithering. I wasn't really. Yeah, I think there's now enough blood in the streets. I think prices are low. People are beginning to understand what the problems are and are getting scared of the problems. And that's the time to take the other side. And I think the other important point I would make is if you're not, if that is not three-year money or four-year money, you shouldn't be fooling around in the stock market in the first place. So if you have that kind of view, Yes, I think you should buy, uh, I mean, again, I mean, my, my, uh, my orientation is you buy the market first and then start figuring out what areas of the market, either sectors or stocks you like. I tend to get attracted to danger, uh, and uh, so I'm not just suggesting everybody should do that, but I think select, I mean, I believe growth will pick up later this year, and uh, both globally, it'll start bottoming out, and in India. So I'm attracted to some of the bank stocks. I'm attracted to uh, uh, especially the PSU banks. I'm attracted to some of the infrastructure and even the, the, the you know, metals areas, which are getting absolutely bombed out. I mean, you have to worry about leverage. You have to worry about other things. But, yeah, broadly, I mean, that's, that's risky, but, uh, you know, I guess that's the business I'm in. <laughs> You say you say PSU banks, uh, metals, uh, and uh, infrastructure, right? Sorry, which was the third one? I, I, yeah, I, I think growth. But I, I, I yeah, yeah, I, I think the next move. Uh, I think we're done with monetary policy worldwide, and I, I and I think if if world growth has to stabilize, get going, it has to be fiscal policy, uh, even in the United States and everywhere it will be fiscal policy. 
So I, I do think that there will be more bridges and roads and tunnels in America, and I think the same thing in India. I think the same thing in a bunch of places. So, and you're in the middle of a growth panic, and people are convinced that, uh, I mean, people are as convinced that nobody needs coal and iron ore today as they were convinced that the Chinese will eat go coal and iron ore five years ago. And that was going straight to the moon. Now it's going st straight to the bottom of the sea. And both are false. Both those are, are illusions. And uh, so, so I, I never thought I'd be attracted to, you know, commodities because I've hated them for a long time because it was such a speculative bubble. But the violence and the price change is so dramatic, so dramatic, that I'm slowly getting attracted to that. So I think that if I were to buy oil at 25 or 28 somewhere here, I think two years from now, well, my best guess is it's going to be up, maybe up a lot. Not in some bull market way, which I've never believed, but yeah, could it go to 40, 45, 50? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, okay. you know, could State Bank of India trade at one and a half times book with a rising book three years from now? I think so. I mean, that's a triple. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, just a quick point, this point that uh, you're saying that monetary policy is maxed out around the world and it'll be, the, it'll be governments using the fiscal route now. What, what happens to, uh, you know, markets hate government spending more. I mean, here in India, the conversation two years back was, uh, mm. you know, go government spending is bad. <clears throat> Last year it became productive government spending is good. Now it's, you know, begging for some spending. If you talk to a lot of, of uh, you know, industry, etc. Exactly. So what happens to that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. well to, at the risk of giving you another great quote, which is, is a line from Shakespeare, nothing is good or bad, thinking makes it, th makes it so. so. So what conventional wisdom is also shifts based on the time and the situation and price. So, so I think... Uh, I think the world will rotate. I mean, Ben Bernanke, who was a brilliant man who studied, perhaps overstudied the Great Depression, knew, absolutely knew for sure that deflation can always be fixed. Inflation may not be always, but deflation can be fixed, which is where he got the name Helicopter Ben, that you just flood the system with liquidity and things will be okay. And Japan has already proven to the world that that's not the case. And we're exactly there. We are back to where we were. So if you had said three years ago or five years ago that we will not ease monetary policy, but the governments will spend, people would have been up in arms. But now that you've tried and failed, I think conventional wisdom shifts. Now you're willing to try something else. And the reason to be bullish on India, by the way, I see these debates, which is, you know, and, and coming up to the budget, you'll see more and more of those. You know, with these really thoughtful debates, oh, shall we go for growth or shall we go for the deficit? As if those are the only two choices. You know, you can go for both. I mean, you know, 40% of GDP is in government-owned assets. Sell those assets and invest in growth. Your deficit is fine and you have growth. But India being India, the obvious and the intelligent will not be debated. We will assume that the right thing can't be done. So let's analyze to death the things that... Um, you know, art of the possible. And, and, and so the reason, I mean, so India has so many degrees of freedom to generate growth that you have to stay bullish. I mean, it's frustrating that we don't unleash it. But other, other governments don't necessarily have that. Spain doesn't have that. Japan doesn't have that. Japan has been through its monetary easing. It's been through its fiscal thing. And it just can't get it going because of demographics, because of lack of immigration, because of lack of productivity there, they've run out of tools. And, uh, and it's a rich country. I mean, India is starting from a very low base, and it has lots of tools to fix itself up. I mean, but we don't do it. And I think slowly we will get there, whether it's you know, GST-led productivity, whether it's railways straightens out itself, and, and that releases productivity, financial inclusion, and the Internet is already doing that, that, you'll have more and more labor market reform over the years, and that will keep unleashing productivity in an up cycle. And, and the biggest one of all is large-scale privatization. And so we have the wherewithal. I mean, we should just sell Ashoka Hotel in Air India and fund growth. I mean, I'm just using two silly examples. 
but 400 to 500 billion dollars of assets are owned by the Indian government that that needn't be owned by them. So that this debate of you know growth versus deficit is a false choice. We can have it have it all. We can have it all, but we won't. I know that. Slowly we might, and which is why it'll be a grudging multi-year bull market as we come out of this growth. Global mess. It's very hard to grow within a global mess. The global mess gets sorted out and local engines start firing. You know, typically Indian, two steps forward, one step back, slowly, blah, blah, blah. But if you have a five, ten, ten year view, I mean, I, I, I don't feel any different. I think we are in a long term structural bull market. Okay, okay. Uh, and enough. these, just these, one last uh, air pockets, air these pockets. fears yeah. are. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Just one last question, Mother. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure you've read in newspapers or heard from friends, people in the market about this entire debate that the government may tinker with the capital gains exemptions. Right. Right now, if you hold stocks for a year, you don't have to pay lo uh, long-term capital gains. Yeah. Uh, apparently, there's some thinking you should make it three years uh, <coughs> yeah. to be eligible for the thing, or I mean, actually, even doing away with the exemption. And any thoughts there? What, uh, one. Struggles to think why the government would want yeah, to do it, silly. but I mean, I, it's I, out there. I think, I, think, I think it's terrible on two counts. I think from, a, from uh, the act of doing it, I, I think is retrograde. It will discourage investment and so on. And frankly, it just also gives a terrible signal. It gives you the signal that the government is tinkering around at the margin with revenue enhancing things that are retrograde as opposed to doing the things they had. So I'm, I'm terribly against it, not as an investor, but as an Indian citizen. I, I think it's just you need to get our savings rate and investment rate at to 40 percent, 38 percent, and this is discouraging. So I, I think it's, it's a bad signal and bad policy. Let's hope uh, it doesn't materialize. Uh, Mother, thank you very, very much. It's always a pleasure uh, having you on the show and uh, uh, getting that perspective across. Thank you very, very thank much. Thank you, Prashad.